the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. So, I want to talk tonight about Endgame, the book on the reality, and the way, I mean that book really began from a fundamental question of do you believe that this culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living? And, you know, I, I've asked that question of thousands of people and nobody ever says yes. But one guy, one of my talks, raised his hand and everybody looks at him. He said, oh, voluntary. No, of course not. And <laughs> um, so the next question is, if you don't believe that the culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living, and you care about the land where you live, what does that mean for your strategy and for your tactics? And the answer is we don't really know. And one of the reasons that we don't know is because we don't really talk about it. And one of the reasons that we don't talk about it is because we're all so busy pretending that we have hope. And I'm going to do some serious hope bashing later. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so that's really where I want to and that's really what the book is about, is, is if you don't believe that the culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation, what do you do? And so I think what I would like to do is, um, is go through the premises of that book. And one of the reasons, I, one of the things I've done in, this, in, in Endgame is I put my premises in boldface in the front of the book. And one of the reasons I did that is because one of the first rules of propaganda is if you can slide your premises by people, you've got them. About Hitler, it was said, from insane premise to monstrous conclusion, Hitler was coldly isolological. So he would say, what are we going to do about the Jewish problem? Gosh, Adolf, good question. What are we going to do about it? But see, what he's done is he's slid the premise by you that there's a Jewish problem you have to do something about. Or similarly, you hear some... Uh, talking head on television say, so how can we make the U.S. economy grow? God, good question. Well, okay, some of the premises. A, we want the U.S. economy to grow. B, we want the U.S. economy to exist. C, who the hell's we? <laughs> and so, like I said, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to slide premises by people. And so I, the, the, the structure of this talk is going to be that I want to go through some of the premises for that book. And the first premise is that um, industrial civilization is not, and civilization itself, but especially industrial civilization, is not and can never be sustainable. Um, civilization is not and can never be sustainable. A few years ago, I was riding in a car with a friend of mine who, we were stuck in traffic, and I was just making conversation, and I said, so George, if you could live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And George can sometimes kind of be a curmudgeon, and that day he was not in a good mood. And he said, Derek, that's a really stupid question. Um, we can fantasize whatever we want, but the truth is there's only one level of technology that's sustainable, and that's the Stone Age. And we're going to be there again someday, and the only question really is what's going to be left of the world when we get there. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that any way of living that's based on the use of non-renewable resources won't last. In fact, it takes anybody but a rocket scientist to figure that out. But before we go any further, it's like, okay, that's nice. What's civilization? And, you know, I've been bashing civilization for about 15 years now, and so I figure I'd probably better finally define it. And the definition that I'm using is that civilization is a way of life that's characterized by the growth of cities. And that's defensible both linguistically and historically. Well, that's nice, Derek, but what's a city? And a city, I've defined as a collection of people living in numbers large enough to require the importation of resources. And what that means is the Talawa on whose land I now live, were not civilized. They didn't require the importation of resources. They didn't live in cities. They lived in villages, camps. And once again, they didn't require the importation of resources. They would eat salmon and clams and huckleberry and salal and salmon and salmon 
and salmon and salmon. And then usually through the winter, they would eat a lot of salmon. Um, and the Talawa lived there for 12,500 years, if you believe the myths of science. And if you believe the myths of the Talawa, then they lived there since the beginning of time. And this culture has been there for 180 years, 170 years, and the area is getting pretty trashed. And um, <laughs> so two things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. One of them is that your way of living can never be sustainable. Because if you require the importation of resources, it means that you've denuded the landscape of that particular resource. And as your city grows, you'll denude an ever larger area. And And denuding the landscape of a resource is harms the land base. It's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I know we've all been told that natural selection is based on competition and that, you know, it's all just a fierce battle for who can be the meanest and grab the most resources most quickly and exploit the most thoroughly. But short of showing how stupid our discourse is, I can disprove that in one sentence if you give me a couple of semicolons. Um, <laughs> and that's those creatures who've survived in the long run have survived in the long run. Semicolon. You don't survive in the long run by hyper-exploiting your surroundings. Semicolon. You survive in the long run by actually making your habitat better. What a concept. Um, okay, so anyway. Um, two things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. One is that you can never be sustainable, which means we could all become the best little natural capitalists in the world, and it doesn't matter. So long as there is this fundamental system in place, it's not going to be sustainable. And the other thing it means is that your way of life must be based on violence, because if you require the importation of resources, trade will never be sufficiently reliable. Because if you require the importation of resources, and the people in the next watershed over aren't going to trade you for it, you're going to take it. Which means we could all become junior bodhisattvas, and it wouldn't matter. The US military would still have to be huge, because how else are they going to get access to our oil that just happens to be under somebody else's land? Um, if they require that oil, they're going to take it. So those two things are really fundamental. Um, so because I've been talking about resources, so I want to go back to what I was saying before about any way of life. Another way to look at all this is any way of life that's based on the use of non-renewable resources also won't last. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what resource you're talking about. Let's, I mean, you would think that if you have a way of life that's based on the use of, I don't know, let's just choose a random example, um, oil. Um, <laughs> you, would, you would think that you would start to consider what's going to happen when this non-renewable resource runs out. That, once again, just by definition, any way of life that's based on the use of non-renewable resources won't last. And I would go a step further, and I would say that any way of life that's based on the hyper-exploitation of renewable resources won't last. So if every year there are fewer salmon returned than the year before, eventually you're going to run out. And everybody knows this except for Michael Sissenwine, who is um, in charge of one of the divisions of the National Marine Fisheries Services. And his response when learning that 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone was to say, that's not a problem. We have to ask what level of decline is reasonable or sustainable. <laughs> exactly. And so in basically two sentences or three sentences, he destroyed the words problem, decline, two sentences. He destroyed the words problem, decline, reasonable, and sustainable. Um, so in, in any case, if every year there are fewer passenger pigeons return than there were the year before, eventually there will be none. If every year there is fewer old growth forest, which once wasn't called old growth forest but was simply called home, um, then eventually it will be gone. And I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to say that any way of life that's based on the use of resources won't last. Because a resource is something there to be used. And there's a great line by a Canadian lumberman, when I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And if when I look at trees, I see dollar bills, I'm going to treat them one way. I'm going to convert them into dollar bills. If when I look at trees, I see trees, I'm going to treat them another way. 
And if when I look at this particular tree, I see this particular tree, I'm going to treat it differently still. And it's the same with fish. If when I look at salmon, I see dollar bills, I'm going to treat them one way. If when I look at salmon, I see salmon, I'm going to treat them another way. If when I look at this particular fish, I see this particular fish, I'll treat it differently still. And the same is true also of, of women. If when I look at women, I see orifices, I'm going to treat them one way. If when I look at women, I see women, I'm going to treat them another way. And if when I look at this particular woman, I see this particular woman, I'm going to treat her differently still. If you perceive another as a resource, you're going to use them as opposed to enter into a relationship with them. And I need to be really clear that just because I perceive a fish as a fish, that doesn't mean that I can't eat it. And there's, I was doing a, a radio interview in Spokane, Washington several years ago, and the interviewer said, you know, Indians exploited salmon too. And I said, no, they didn't. They ate them. And he said, what's the difference? I said, well, they gave them respect for the spirit in exchange for the flesh. And I knew that that answer was kind of bullshit, but I'm a male, and so I'm required by law to answer every question that's asked of me. Um, <laughs> and so that afternoon, I went out, and I sat next to this tree that I had a long relationship with, and I asked the tree, what is the fundamental predator-prey relationship? And the tree gave me the answer right away, which is, if you consume the flesh of another, you now take responsibility for the continuation of the other's community. So if I consume the flesh of s salmon from the Klamath River, I now take responsibility for the continuation of the Klamath River salmon. And that's, everybody knows this. You know, bears know it, mergansers know it, newts know it. The mergansers know that if you consume all the newts in this pond, there won't be any newts in the pond anymore. And we just forget sometimes. And that's the fundamental predator-prey bargain that we have to get into. And I want to go, I want to say something else about that, um, and then we'll come back to the other. But um, I got into a big argument with this guy several years ago because he was saying that because I use toilet paper that I am just as culpable for deforestation as the CEO of Weyerhaeuser. And I knew that that was wrong, but <laughs> I, I couldn't really articulate why. And, um, and he said, go ask a tree. A tree will tell you. So I went out and asked a tree, and the tree said, you're an animal. You consume things. Get over it. And, but then I, it also gave me the, the other answer, which is, yes, I am culpable, not because I consume the flesh of a tree. I'm culpable because I consume the flesh of a tree without fulfilling my end of the bargain. I'm culpable, not because I use toilet paper, but because I don't stop Weyerhaeuser from deforesting. And that's a much more serious culpability than simply consuming. So I'm not culpable because I consume Klamath River salmon. I'm culpable because I consume Klamath River salmon and I don't take out the fucking Iron Gate. Um, thanks. Okay, second premise is that um, traditional communities do not often voluntarily give up or sell the resources on which their communities are based until their communities have been destroyed. They also do not willingly allow their land bases to be damaged so that other resources, gold, oil, and so on, can be extracted. It follows that those who want the resources will do what they can to destroy traditional communities, as we see. Third premise. Our way of living, industrial civilization, is based on, requires, and will collapse very quickly without persistent and widespread violence. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago in, in um, Eugene, and afterwards this guy raised his hand and he said, you know, you talk about how violent this culture is, and I just don't see it. There's no violence in my life. I'm not violent myself. I just, just I don't see any violence. And it's significant to this story, by the way, that it was a man who said it, not a woman. Um, and I said, okay, um, where's your shirt made? And he looked, and it was made in Bangladesh. And I said, do we even need to talk about that? He's like, no. I said, okay. And also, I'm just wondering, do you pay rent? He's like, yeah. I said, why? He said, because I don't own? I said, no, what would happen if you didn't pay rent? He said, well, I get evicted. I said, what does that mean? What, I don't understand. What happens when you get evicted? And he said, well, a sheriff would come to my house, and he would, I said, stop, right there. What happens? A sheriff comes to your house, and you say, hey, I was just getting done cooking dinner. Come on in. Have some food. So the sheriff comes in, sits down, and you cook him dinner, and you feed him, and you don't poison him. And uh, then after dinner, he, uh, you say to him, you know, 
It's been nice having you here, but your company's not all that pleasant, so I would like for you to leave my home now. What would happen? He said, well, the sheriff would take out his gun, and he'd say, I'm here to evict you. You've got to leave, because you didn't pay your rent. I said, ah, so the reason you pay rent is because if you don't, some guy is going to come to your house with a gun, and he's going to kick you out of your home. He's like, I guess. I said, okay, let's try it again. What happens if you're really hungry, and so you go to the grocery store, Lots of food there, you know. And uh, you start eating. What's going to happen? So we're going to call the sheriff, and he's going to come. And he's the same, ass same guy. He's a real asshole, isn't he? Um, the sheriff's going to come and take you away. So what this means is that in order for you to survive, in order for you to have a place to sleep, a place to be, you have to pay somebody. And in order to eat, you have to pay somebody. That's really weird. And if you don't, somebody with a gun is going to come and do something bad to you. So part of the reason that a lot of us don't see the violence is because, well, part of the reason is a different subject. Part of the reason is because a lot of the violence is exported. I was doing a talk in Massachusetts a few years ago, and somebody said to me afterwards, you know, we now are living way more sustainably than they did 100 years ago. And I said, how do you, how do you know that? He said, because there's a lot more trees here in Massachusetts than there were 100 years ago. I said, yeah, it's because you're getting out your wood from South America. And so a lot of the violence is simply exported. And then the other part of it is a lot of us don't perceive this violence because we've been so metabolized into the system and we so accept its premises that there's no need to do violence to us because we're standing straight in line. But of course, if we step out the tiniest bit, Got to watch out. Um, oh, but we're not going to do that. OK, now we go to the fourth premise. Uh, this culture, civilization, this, this is, I think might, might be my favorite premise of the book, is based on a clearly defined and widely accepted, yet often unarticulated hierarchy. Violence done by those higher on the hierarchy to those lower is nearly always transparent, invisible. It's unnoticed. When it is noticed, it's fully rationalized. Violence done by those lower on the hierarchy to those higher is, met with, is, is unthinkable. And when it does happen, it's met with shock, horror, and the fetishization of the victims. And there's so many examples of this. Um, one example is that within my own family when I was a kid, my father was extremely violent. And you know, so the violence flowed constantly downhill. And the one time that my brother ever fought back, he got beaten far worse than any other time because, of course, he had committed blasphemy by sending violence up the hierarchy. Uh, that's one example. Um, another example is, oh, I live where there's, there's tons of bears near where I live. And I just, I just love seeing, oh, it's so cool. Uh, a mother and baby bear actually fell asleep outside my mom's house the other day. And so cool. I was thinking about that afterwards. How many wild animals have I ever seen asleep? And, well, two bears. Um, um, maybe some grasshoppers, it's hard to tell. Um, um, Anyway, so, I mean, so, but people, and, I, and I, walk, I walk through the forest all the time. I walk through the forest at night with no lantern and all this stuff. And the Fed's going, huh, he walks through the forest at night with no lantern. You can use that. Um, anyway, um, anyway, so I walk through the forest. I'm scared of the Feds, frankly, not the, the bears. Anyway, so I walk through the forest at, at night, and, and people go, oh, my God, aren't you scared of, of the bears? I mean, they could, they, could, they could attack or something. And I know that there is one person dies in North America every other year from bear attacks. <laughs> and 46,000 Americans die every year because of automobile crashes. So we're scared of the wrong thing. I mean, we should walk through a parking lot and it's like, oh my god, you know? The, <laughs> the cars are all going, <laughs> Anyway, if, if you don't believe me about the violence is only allowed to flow one direction with that, the next time there's one of those, you know, like the next time there's a big, big protest or something, uh, maybe anti-war or anti-so-called free trade, you know, whatever, um, just do an experiment, which is take a baseball bat <laughs> and then just walk up to one of the, one of the policemen Aww. and say, excuse me, Officer Friendly, um, nothing personal. I'm just conducting an experiment. <laughs> and hit him. And then hit him a couple more times real fast. And then, um,
Somebody's going to take down your name. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, and then I'll talk to you in about 50 years. Um, because you've, you've, you've committed blasphemy, you've sent violence up the hierarchy. Oh, and then, then I want to say one more thing about this, which is that, that um, then this is going to have to, does anybody mind if I swear? Um, I think that the word fuck is the most amazing word in the English language because it's all of patriarchy condensed into four letters. Because the same word that means make love to means do great violence to. That's really, really twisted. And it's also kind of confusing. I mean, because so somebody can say to me, like, I'm going to fuck you. And I'm like, I need more information. I mean, even within the context of a loving heterosexual relationship, this shows how deeply the objectification of women, how deep the objectification of women goes within this culture and within our language, is even within the context of a loving heterosexual relationship, it's really hard to not have the woman get objectified. So the man says to the woman, I would like to be inside of you. You know what just happened? She's the object of the sentence. Okay, on the other hand, the woman says to the man, I would like for you to be inside me. You know what? She's still the object of the sentence. So the man says to the woman, I would like for you to be around me. And she's like, I'm sorry, can you speak English? I don't, I don't know what you want. Um, where it's like okay for homosexuals to be in the military as long as you don't talk about it. I guess you can do whatever you want, you just can't talk. It's, anyway, but, um, which by the way, I have to say full disclosure here, I have to say that I actually agree that homosexuals should not be allowed in the military. I feel very strongly actually that homosexuals should not be allowed in the military. But that probably doesn't mean as much as it could because I also think that heterosexuals, asexuals, the transgendered, um, bisexuals should not be allowed in the military either. Um, fifth premise. The property of those higher on the hierarchy is more valuable than the lives of those below. It is acceptable for those above to increase the amount of property they control in everyday language to make money by destroying or taking the lives of those below. This is called production. If those below damage the property of those above, those above may kill or otherwise destroy the lives of those below. This is called justice. Um, sixth premise uh, is the one that I sort of alluded to early on. Uh, this culture is not redeemable. The culture won't undergo any sort of voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable way of living. If we don't put a halt to it, civilization, this culture, will continue to immiserate the vast majority of humans and to degrade the planet until it, civilization, and probably the planet, collapses. The effects of this degradation will continue to harm humans and non-humans for a very long time. Seventh premise. The longer we wait for civilization to crash, or the longer we wait before we ourselves bring it down, the messier will be the crash, and the worse things will be for those humans and non-humans who live during it and for those who come after. If somebody would have brought down civilization, whatever that means, 200 years ago, if Tecumseh would have won, then people in the East would still be able to eat passenger pigeons. I mean, never minding passenger pigeons' beautiful existence for themselves. If somebody would have brought down civilization 100 years ago, people in this region, through the crash, would still be able to eat salmon. There's going to be people sitting along the banks of the Columbia 50 years from now and, well, they'll be glowing, for one thing, because of Hanford. And they'll also be starving to death. And they'll be saying, I'm starving to death because you allowed the dams to stand. God damn you. And you know, but the dams are really important. You know, they're necessary for the electricity to make it so safe co-field. You can move the... Uh, the top back and forth. <laughs> then necessary to smelt aluminum for beer cans. Um, anyway, so the longer we wait, I mean, I mean, if somebody would have brought down civilization 100 years ago, we wouldn't have to worry about much about global warming. We wouldn't have to worry about the toxification of the total environment with pesticides. We wouldn't have to worry about docks and every mother's breast milk. I mean, if 50 and 75 years from now, are people going to be going, you know, if somebody would have brought it down 75 years ago, we'd still have amphibians. 
Um, if somebody had brought it down 75 years ago, we would still have, uh, well, somebody brought it down 15 years ago. They'll be saying 15 years now, from now. We'll still, we'd still have sturgeon. You know, it's like, how long? You know, at what point? What's the threshold, you know? 100 years from now, it's like we'd still have, you know, name it. <laughs> we'd still have oceans. Air to breathe. You know, that's not, that's not one of my premises, but, but that's, that's something that, that if I would have thought of it when I was writing the book would have been one of the premises, which is the primary, if not only, measure by which we'll be judged by those who come after is going to be the health of the land base. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we voted Democrat, Republican, Green, anarchist, didn't vote at all. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we recycled. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we were violent or nonviolent. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we're nice people or not nice people. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we uh, wrote great books or made great films or did great talks or anything else. They're going to care about whether they can breathe the air and drink the water. You know, we can all fantasize whatever we want about some groovy eco-socialist utopia with free love everywhere. It doesn't fucking matter if you can't breathe the air and can't drink the water. And the only measure, I mean, it's embarrassing to say this, but the only measure by which any generation will be judged is the health of the land base that they pass on. That brings us to the eighth premise of the book. The needs of the natural world are more important than the needs of the economic system. The needs of the natural world are more important than the needs of the economic system. I have, thanks. I have just guaranteed I will never hold public office. <laughs> Another way to put the eighth premise is, any economic or social system that doesn't benefit the natural communities on which it's based is unsustainable, immoral, and really stupid. <laughs> Sustainability, morality, and intelligence, as well as justice, requires the dismantling of any such economic or social system, or at the very least, disallowing it from damaging your land base. Okay, ninth premise. Oh, the ninth premise is pretty interesting. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm getting kind of cold. <clears throat> um, it's pretty interesting. You know, I can bash almost anything I want, and people are cool with it. You know, I can bash capitalism, that's fine. I can bash uh, environmentalism, that's fine. I can bash anarcho-primitivism, that's fine. I can bash myself, that's fine. I can bash blah, 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 it's fine. But there's a few things that you, you like, cannot bash. Um, for example, if I bash, um, oh my god, when I bash science, I can just feel the sphincters in the audience start to quiver. Um, um, or, or also, if I, like, if I bash Buddhism, oh my god. It's like, you have not lived until you've been chased down the street by a bunch of pacifists. Um, 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 or another one that's really hard to talk about is, is, um, is population. And because if you, if you mention that there are more humans on the planet than the planet can support, then people suddenly start to presume that you're actually anti-human, um, which doesn't really follow in my mind. Oh, it's great too, I gotta tell you this. That, um, you know, they say there's no such thing as a stupid question. I got one the other day. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna like tell everybody in the country. Um, there's this, this, I sometimes do interviews on a radio station south, one county, down in Humboldt County, one south county south of where I live. And there's this guy who hates, hates me and hates what I say so much that every time I'm on there, he calls up and I, I'm not sure, I think he attacks me, but I usually can't figure out what the hell he's saying. And, um, and one time I was saying that humans have exceeded carrying capacity, and carrying capacity is the, the number of any given species who could live in a particular place forever without harming it. So you could have, um, you could have an island that has a carrying capacity of a thousand deer. A thousand deer could live there forever. But if you put 10,000 deer there, they're going to uh, eat too much of the vegetation, cause erosion, and lower the carrying capacity, make it so the place can only support 500 deer. Anyway, so I was saying that humans have exceeded carrying capacity. And he called up just sputtering, and he said, how dare you say that humans have exceeded their capacity to care? 
which may or may not be the case, but that's a different question. Um, anyway, so, so the ninth premise is basically, although there will clearly someday be far fewer humans than there are at present, there are many ways this reduction in population could occur. Some of those ways would be characterized by extreme violence and privation. Nuclear Armageddon, for example, would certainly reduce both population and consumption, yet would do so horrifically. The same would be true for a continuation of overshoot followed by crash. Other ways would be characterized by less violence. Um, you know, and I don't know what is going to happen, obviously, but this much I do know, that if we don't approach these problems actively, if we don't talk about our predicament and what we're going to do about it, the violence will be almost undoubtedly be more severe, the privation more extreme. And I want to be really clear. Every cell in my body wants for us to have a voluntary transformation. Just like every cell in my body wants for... That must be the tow truck. Um, just like every cell in my body wants for people to approach the whole question of there being too many humans, and I'm going to talk more about population in a second, but anyway, every cell in my body wants for us to approach that just reasonably and rationally and intelligently, but of course we all know what we're going to do is just continue on this freight train to hell until it continues to fly off the cliff. Okay, so anyway, um, having said that, I need to say, by the way, that I don't think that population is actually, yes, there are more humans than the planet can support, but I don't think the population is a primary problem. I think population is actually a tertiary problem. The reason I think population is secondary instead of primary is that I think consumption is way more important. Because when, I mean, actual numbers don't matter. There could be 100 gazillion people on the planet, and if they didn't eat, shit, or stand anywhere, it wouldn't matter. The important thing is how much damage you're causing or how much help you're doing. Imagine that also, that humans can actually benefit their land base. What a strange concept that is. Anyway, um, and that's really important because when I think about overpopulation, the first image that comes to mind is, honestly, is a little brown baby with a distended belly in a third world nation. First image that comes to mind. When I think of overconsumption, the first thing I think of is an American. And who causes more damage? Um, so that's why I don't think the population is a primary problem, but a secondary problem. And the reason I don't think the population is a secondary problem, but it's actually a tertiary problem, is because, are there any demographers in here? Good, I hate demographers. Um, <laughs> and the reason I hate demographers is because sometimes they talk about something called the natural rate of population growth, which is that if you have X number of people, then, you know, the population exponentially rises, blah, blah, blah. And it presumes that people breed like rabbits. And the truth is, I don't even think rabbits breed like rabbits. Um, it presumes that people don't make rational family planning decisions based upon their personal and social circumstances. Once again, the Tala will live there for 12,500 years in relatively steady state. And part of the reason is because they had an intimate relationship with their land base, and they would perceive damage to the land base as damage. And if perhaps they start to have too many babies, well, let's cut back. And, I mean, you would think, I mean, let's just think about this. What happens if you have a culture where somebody writes a book, and in this book they tell people to go forth and multiply, and this book becomes a really big bestseller? Um, that's going to affect family planning decisions. Um, and also, I need to say this, too, that there were, in Native North America, there were about 250 different... Um, plants that were used as contraceptives and abortifactants by, um, by the women. And the decisions to use those were made by women. A bunch of fucking primitives. Um, and, yeah, imagine that. And, oh, it's, I gotta tell you the story too, this is so cool. Is, um, back, uh, at one point, you know, a bunch of male anthropologists went out and you know, anthropologists like exclusively male at one point, and a bunch of anthropologists went out and they were, they were trying to find out what indigenous peoples would use for contraceptive. And they would go talk to the men, because of course the men are the only ones we're talking to. And they'd say, so how do you not make babies? And they're like... That is a really good question. And so a lot of the anthropologists were saying, hmm, Indigenous people don't know where babies come from. And then <laughs> when, um, when women started getting into anthropology, the women would go talk to 
the, the, the indigenous peoples, and they would talk to the women, and they would say, you know, how do you not get pregnant? And the women would say, oh, you know, if you take this certain route when you're 16, then you're sterile for five years, and when you, you know, then when you're 20, then you have to do this and this. And the men are like, really? <laughs> I had no idea. Um, oh, I want to say one more thing about population, which is that, um, which is that, uh, you know, the, the whole thing about making a, uh, a wall down in, down in Mexico or down at the border of Mexico and how we need to stop all those Mexicans from coming up and the Central Americans and the El Guatemalans and the Nicaraguans or whatever their names are. Um, the, uh, I have to say that I am actually strongly in favor of closing the border to Mexico um, on one condition. Um, which is that if you close it to people, you close it to the movement of resources as well. Um, bringing down civilization, when I talk about that, it's not a monolithic act. It's a billion different acts done by a billion different people. And part of my definition, actually my definition of bringing down civilization is depriving the rich of the ability to steal from the poor and depriving the powerful of the ability to destroy the world. Okay, that's nice, Derek, but that doesn't alter the fact that there are, there are people who are dependent upon this social system which is killing the planet. I mean, that's part of the problem is that just like any good abusive situation, we have been made dependent upon the very system that's exploiting us. And part of the reason that we don't fight back more is because if your experience is that your water comes from a tap and that your food comes from a grocery store, not your head, not your heart, but your experience, if that's your experience, you'll fight to the death to defend that system that brings you your food and water because your life depends on it. And similarly, if your water comes from a river and your food comes from a land base, people used to drink out of rivers, how quaint is that? Um, if your experience is that your water comes from a river and that your food comes from a land base, you will fight to the death to defend that because your life depends on it. But we have all been so made dependent on this system. I mean, it becomes really problematical. It's very nice, Derek, but what are you going to do about this? Anyway, back to the original thing, that taking down civilization is not a monolithic act. It's a billion different acts with a billion different moralities. And so, for example, I don't care what your motivation is. Um, if you blow up a children's hospital, that is an atrocity. I don't care if you're, if you're an anarcho-primitivist or if you're a member of the US military. That's just bad. There is no way you can make a moral case for blowing up a children. Oh, if you're bringing freedom and democracy to a country. <laughs> um, which, by the way, I figured out how to listen to George Bush's speech without going insane. Um, well, turn off the volume, for one thing. Um, <laughs> but if you're not going to do that, another way to do it that actually makes everything perfectly clear is just do a word substitution. And I came up with this idea back when they did the whole freedom fries thing, when they changed french fries to freedom fries. It's great. All you do is word for word substitution. Every time George Bush says the word freedom, substitute the word fascism. Every time he says the word um, democracy, substitute the word corporate control. So we're bringing freedom and democracy to Iraq. Damn straight. Um, oh, I want to say something else, too, and we're going to get back to the other, don't worry. And everybody in here, of course, now by now certainly knows why my books are written in nonlinear fashion. Um, anyway, um, this whole we thing, you know, we're bringing freedom and democracy to, to, to Iraq, is just so weird because one of the things I think we really need to do is break that identification with the system and with those in power. But it's like this friend of mine called me up not very long ago, and she said, how much longer do you think we're going to be in Iraq? And I said, we're in Iraq? Oh my God, I thought we were in Northern California. And she's like, okay. How much longer do you think our troops are going to be in Iraq? I said, I got troops? <laughs> Holy shit, will they do what I tell them? If, they take, if I tell them to take out the Grand Coulee, will they do it? And she's like, Derek, this is why I only call you once every six weeks. <laughs> Anyway, so, so, you know, I don't care what your motivation is, you cannot make a moral case for blowing up a children's hospital. That's just an atrocity.
I have to admit that line has never before gotten a joke or laugh. I'm sorry? You have to go to Nicaragua. Okay. Right. Well, but see, you can't, you can't make a moral case. Well, except if you're bringing freedom and the, the point, insofar as there is one, is that um, we can make up any hypothetical case we want to keep us from ever doing anything. And the truth is, once again, that on a real fundamental level, you, you, you can't make a moral case against taking out cell phone towers. Um, okay, that's nice, Derek, but the truth is that when this culture falls apart, as this, as this culture falls apart, a lot of people are going to die. Psych. Okay. My next answer is, who are we talking about? If we're talking about salmon people, they're like, bring that fucker down. Talking about polar bear people, they're like, yep. Prairie dog people, they're like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> what about subsistence farmers? Subsistence farmers around the world. It's like I asked my friend Anurata Mittal, former, direct, former executive director of Food First, if the people of India would be better off if the uh, global economy disappeared tomorrow. And she said, of course. And some of the examples she gave is there are former granaries of India that are now exporting dog food and tulips to Europe. So there are people who are starving to death right now because where they used to get their food is now making cash crops. And of course, this happens the world over. So it depends who we're talking about. You know, it's like the uh, indigenous people, the traditional indigenous people around the world would be better off immediately. The um, subsistence farmers, better off immediately. The landless being forced off their land, better off immediately. Uh, rural poor, the world over, better off immediately. Uh, I'm going to say, what is it? I, I'm going to make up this number, but it's like, 30% of the people in the world um, have no access, have, have like never used electricity. It's, it's some fairly high percentage, 30, 40 percent, something like that. Um, I mean, so they're not going to be bothered one bit by the removal of the electrical infrastructure. Um, so the, the rural poor, many of them would be better off immediately. The um, urban poor, would be, well, the urban rich actually would be, I'm sorry, the rural, the rural poor would be better off immediately. The rural rich would be fine. They're going to have guns anyway. Um, the urban poor are fucked. Um, they, well, in one sense, they would be in really bad, and of course, in the long run, they'd be better off because the system that's exploiting them would be gone, but in the short run, they'd be really, really bad because the food is coming in to the city. But on the other hand, you want to talk about instant land reform? Uh, remove U.S. support for the governing people immediately, and you got instantaneous land reform. So I don't know. Uh, and then there's also the urban rich, but fuck them. They're the problem in the first place. Okay, here's another part, is that I can guarantee, this is actually more important, I can guarantee that 100%, 100% of the problems as this culture collapses are going to be because those in power, those who are already destroying the world, attempt to maintain that lifestyle as the world collapses. At any moment, at any moment, those in power, whatever that means, could choose to have a soft landing. I mean, that's one of my secret fantasies, is that, is that suddenly we start using all of this cleverness that we think we have to actually solve problems instead of make new ones. And that you know the, the Fed start paying Weyerhaeuser not to deforest but to reforest. I mean, I don't fucking care if Weyerhaeuser still gets the money. I don't care about justice in that sense. I just want forests. And so it's like they can even give the same goddamn subsidies, the same goddamn companies. And if it was moving the right direction, I wouldn't complain. Um, it's like we always hear that the world's running out of water. We hear that all the time. You know, people are dying of thirst because we're running out of water. Bullshit. Fucking bullshit. Goddamn fucking George Bush goddamn fucking bullshit. Um, <laughs> the world is not running out of water. Water is being stolen. Ninety percent of the water that's used by human beings is used for industry and agriculture. It's like they always say, take shorter showers. Fuck. You know? 
All that does is annoy the people close to you. Um, <laughs> the, the same amount of water is used by municipal human beings as is used for municipal golf courses. Um, once again, 90% of the water is used for agriculture and industry. So people are not running out of water. Water is being stolen from them. And so it's like if somebody were to take out the uh, Glen Canyon Dam, or if it were just to collapse on its own, if <laughs> the point is that, I mean, we all know the numbers, you know, from, from, you know, from Francis Moore LePay and everything about how there is enough food to feed everyone. And we could have that soft landing. Those in power could choose at any moment. But it's like, that's nice, Derek, but that doesn't alter the fact that wanting to bring down civilization is going to kill a lot of people. Even if those decisions are made by those in power, it's still going to kill a lot of people. And I finally came up with an answer that I'm really happy with, and I want to share that with you now. Um, you know, what do you do with the fact that no matter what you do, you're involved in mass murder? You know, because if, if you're civilized, if you're part of this system already, your hands are blood red. It's just you don't notice it usually. Um, you know, and every action within the industrial economy is harmful, which is really fucked up too. I mean, that's another thing that, that we, we have been, that's been stolen from us, is the ability to have a fine meal without it being destructive. The ability to simply live without, without knowing that you're destroying things by your actions. Um, anyway, what do you do with the fact that no matter what you do, you're involved in mass murder? And for now, I've got an answer. If you've gotten this far in this book, if you're simply anything other than entirely insensate, we probably agree that civilization is going to crash, whether or not we help bring it about. If you don't agree with this, we probably have nothing to say to each other. Hey, Lou Pinella got picked up by the Cubs. That's pretty cool. We probably also agree that the crash will be messy. We agree further that since industrial civilization is systematically dismantling the ecological infrastructure of the planet, the sooner civilization comes down, whether or not we help it crash, the more life will remain afterwards to support both humans and non-humans. If you agree with all this, and if you don't want to dirty your spirituality and conscience with the physical work of helping to bring down civilization, and if your primary concern really is for the well-being of those humans who will be alive during and immediately after the crash, then given, and I repeat this point to emphasize it, the civilization is going to come down anyway, you need to start preparing people for the crash. Instead of coming to my talks and attacking me for stating the obvious, go rip up asphalt in vacant parking lots to convert them to neighborhood gardens. <laughs> go teach people how to identify local edible plants, even the city, especially in the city, so these people won't starve when the proverbial shit hits the fan, they can no longer head off to Albertsons for groceries. Set up committees to eliminate or, if appropriate, channel the additional violence that might break out. We need it all. We need people to take out dams. We need people to knock out electrical infrastructures. We need people to protest and to chain themselves to trees. We also need people working to ensure that as many people as possible are equipped to deal with the fallout when the collapse comes. We need people working to teach others what wild plants to eat, what plants are natural antibiotics. We need people teaching others how to purify water, how to build shelters. All this can look like supporting traditional local knowledge. It can look like starting rooftop gardens. It can look like planting local varieties of medicinal herbs. And, and it can look like teaching people how to sing. The truth is that although I do not believe that designing groovy eco-villages will help bring down civilization, when the crash comes, I'm sure to be first in line knocking on their doors asking for food. <laughs> people taking out dams do not have a responsibility to ensure that people in homes previously powered by hydro know how to cook over a fire. They do, however, have a responsibility to support the people doing that work. Similarly, the people growing medicinal plants in preparation for the end of civilization do not have a responsibility to take out dams. They do, however, have a responsibility at the very least to not condemn those people who have chosen that work. In fact, they have a responsibility to support them. They especially have a responsibility to not report them to the cops. It's the same old story. The good thing about everything being so fucked up is that no matter where you look, there's great work to be done. Do what you love, do what you can, do it by search your land base. We need it all. That doesn't mean that everybody taking out dams and everybody working to cultivate medicinal plants are working toward the same goals. It does mean that if they are, each should see the importance of the other's work. 
further resistance needs to be global acts of resistance are more effective in their large scale and coordinated the infrastructure is monolithic and centralized so common tools and techniques can be used to dismantle it in many different places simultaneously if possible by contrast the work of renewal must be local i have a new catchphrase which is dismantle globally renew locally <laughs> to be truly effective oh, another catchphrase i have is um protect your land base you can't have sex without it um, <laughs> Anyway, to be truly effective, acts of survival and livelihood need to grow from particular land bases where they'll thrive. People need to enter into conversation with each piece of earth and all its human and non-human inhabitants. That doesn't mean, of course, that we can't share ideas or that one water purification technique won't be useful in many different locations. It does mean that people in those places need to decide for themselves what will work. Most important of all, the water in each place needs to be asked and allowed to decide for itself. I've been thinking a lot again about the cell phone tower behind Safeway. And I see now how these different approaches manifest in this one small place. The cell phone tower needs to come down. It's contiguous on two sides with abandoned parking lots. Those lots need to come up. Gardens can bloom in their place. We can even do our work side by side. OK, no segue at all. The, ne the next premise is the culture as a whole and most of its members are insane. I don't need to talk about that, do I? <laughs> uh, the culture is driven by a death urge, an urge to destroy life. <coughs> Speaking of genitals, did you know that Nicole Kidman does not like to wear underwear? I read that in the newspaper, so it must be true. <coughs> the point is that it is literally insane that I know what is on Angelina Jolie's genitals and what is not on Nicole Kidman's. But it took me about three or four years of living where I do to learn that there was a massacre of about 250 Indians about two miles from where I live at a place called Yontaket, another massacre of another 100 Indians or so at a place called Hawanket right over here. And then right over here, there was another massacre at a place called Achillette. And <laughs> anyway, it's insane that I know that the Mets would have had a better chance if Pedro weren't hurting, but I can't name 10 species of edible plants and, and fungi who live within 100 yards of my home. That's, I mean, part of the reason that we don't defend the places we live is because we don't live there. We live with Brad and Angelina, and we live with Pedro and his hurt hip and his hurt toe, and we live with uh, Kenny Rogers and the smudges on his hands. And Okay, so like I said, I don't think I can name 10 species of edible plants and fungi within 100 yards of my home. There's blackberries, huckleberries, salal, thimbleberry, salmonberry, blackberry. <laughs> oh, and there's those big red mushrooms with the white dots. The eleventh premise of the book is, from the beginning, this culture, civilization, has been a culture of occupation, and the government is a government of occupation. What does a government of occupation do? It moves in, it facilitates resource extraction, and maximizes production. So what they do, that's their job. What does U.S. government do? <coughs> moves in, facilitates resource extraction, and maximizes production. You know, and all my American Indian friends are saying, so what the hell took you so long to figure this one out? Um, I would like to read something about that. Um, okay, if Nazis or other fascists took over North America, <laughs> what would we all do? Oh, we'd watch television by gum. What would we do if they implemented Mussolini's definition of fascism? Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it's a merger of state and corporate power. And what would we do if they then instituted laws allowing them to put a significant portion, say one-third, of all Jewish males from the ages of 18 and 35 into concentration camps? What if this occupied country called itself a democracy, but most everybody understood elections to be shams, with citizens allowed to choose between different wings of the same fascist or following Mussolini corporate party? It's like, you know, the capitalist press used to just laugh and laugh and laugh that the, the Soviet Politburo was... Um, 
made up of like 99% members of the Communist Party. It's like, okay, so the U.S. Congress and House of Representatives is made up of what percent of members of the Capitalist Party? I think it's about 99%, uh, with 1% absent. Um, <laughs> what if anti-government activity was opposed by stormtroopers and secret police? Oh, that's another of my secret fantasies, is, is the next time there's one of those um, like big WTO meetings or something, that the cops will turn around and they'll start shooting at the WTO representatives. Um, <laughs> we all have our fantasies. Um, because, of course, they have much more in, in, in common with us as in terms of class interest than they do with their masters. But the reason, of course, that can't happen is because the violence is only allowed to flow down the hierarchy. And for them to shoot at their masters um, would be violence flowing up the hierarchy. Anyway, what if anti-government activity was opposed by stormtroopers and secret police? Would you fight back? If there already existed a resistance movement, would you join it? Substitute the word African-American for Jewish and ask yourself the same question. Because, of course, about a third of all African-American males in the ages of 18 and 35 are under so-called criminal justice supervision. Anyway, would you resist if the fascists irradiated the countryside and poisoned food supplies, made rivers unfit for swimming and so filthy you wouldn't even dream of drinking from them anymore? What if they did that because, hell, I can't finish that sentence, because no matter how I try, I can't come up with a motivation good enough even for fascists to irradiate and toxify the landscape and water supplies. If fascists systematically deforested the continent, would you join an underground army of resistance, head to the forest and from there to boardrooms in the halls of the Reichstag to pick off the occupying deforesters, and most especially those who get them their marching orders? I mean, what would we all do if space aliens came down, that's where they come from, if aliens came down from outer space and they started to vacuum the oceans and they were putting docks in every mother's breast milk, and they were um, just, you know, clear-cutting the planet. They were changing the climate, and they were giving us, like, cool computer games and stuff. You know, <laughs> what would we do? You know, I mean, I, I, we would grab our camo outfits, we would grab our AK-47s, and... Wrong audience. Um, <clears throat> so am I, like, the only person here with an AK-47? I shared the stage with Ward Churchill a while ago, and um, I said the same thing. Am I the only person here with an AK-47? He was out in the audience when I was doing my talk. I said, am I the only person here with an AK-47? Just silence in the audience. And I hear this voice go, nope. <laughs> um, I mean, seriously, what would we do if instead of it being, you know, the U.S. government, the corporations run by the U.S. government, what if instead of the Iraqis had invaded? You know, the Iraqis were so close to invading. Um, <laughs> You know, what if they were Iraqis who were doing all this? You know, we would, we would fight back. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe your sense of kin, your sense of skin doesn't extend to the natural world. Maybe you don't, you don't yet love the land where you live enough that you'll fight for it. But what if the fascists toxify not only the landscape, but the bodies of those you love? What if their actions put dozens of carcinogens into the flesh of your lover, children, mother, brother, sister, father? How many people in here have had someone you love die of cancer? It's about 80 percent, 70 percent. Would you fight back? What if the fascists toxify your own body? Would you still cling to the illusion that their edicts carry more weight than that brought to bear by their secret and not so secret police? Would you work for this regime? Would you teach others its virtues? Or would you fight back? If you won't fight back when they toxify your own body, when precisely will you fight back? Give me, and more importantly yourself, a threshold at which you finally take a stand. If you can or won't give the threshold, why not? None of these questions are rhetorical. The questions are real. They are, at this point, some of the most important questions there are. So what I'd like to do is, I've got one, two, uh, three more premises I want to talk about. Well, I want to do two premises. I want to bash pacifism, and then I want to bash hope, and then read two things real fast, and then, and then, and then we're done. <laughs> okay. Next premise. There are no rich people in the world, and there are no poor people. There's just people. The rich may have lots of pieces of paper that many pretend are worth something, and the poor may not. The rich claim they own land, and the poor are denied the right to make the same claim. A primary purpose of the police is to enforce the delusions of those with lots of pieces of paper. Those without the papers generally buy into these delusions almost as quickly and completely as those with. Those delusions carry with them extreme consequences in the real world. What I mean by this is Warehouser doesn't own any land. Warehouser doesn't actually exist. But insofar as we pretend it exists, we all agree 
the warehouser owns land. But warehouser doesn't own any land. It's like there's a bunch of cars out there, but they don't belong to anybody. And I can say this because, of course, my truck is like 500 miles away. Um, but we all agree that this person owns this land, and this person owns this land, and these corporations own this much land. And did you know, by the way, that, that land ownership concentration in the United States is, land ownership is more concentrated in the United States than it is in so-called banana republics like Honduras? Um, I don't remember the numbers. They're in Strange Like War. But it's basically, oh, I'm not even going to make them up. But the rich own lots of land. The point is, that's just a cultural convention. We all agree the warehouser owns land. Those agreements have consequences in the real world. I want to be really clear about two things. One is, I'm not saying there is no such thing as ownership of land. The Talua own the land where I live. They don't have a piece of paper that says it's theirs, but they own it. And the reason they own it is because they lived there for 12,500 years, and their blood is mixed with the soil. The other thing I want to be clear that I'm not saying, I'm not saying that all cultural conventions are bad. What I'm saying is that with all the world at stake, we might start beginning to examine which of the cultural conventions we want to keep and which ones we want to get rid of. And allowing corporations to exist is one we might want to consider getting rid of. Um, and allowing corporations to own land is one we may wish to get rid of. Um, OK, those in power rule by force. And the sooner we break ourselves of illusions to the contrary, the sooner we can at least begin to make reasonable decisions about whether, when, and how we're going to resist. The, we'll skip the 14th and do the 15th premise. Um, I love this one. Love does not imply pacifism. Um, I get this book. They're, they're, they're two big books. And they really were supposed to, they're originally supposed to be pamphlets. Um, <laughs> And you're seeing now, several hours later, why they ended up. Um, and what it was going to be, it was, it was going to be, I, I found that when I would do talks about fighting back, that the resistance, that, that, the, that, the, that the response by the audience was really predictable. And that sort of, a lot of mainstream peace and social justice activists and a lot of mainstream environmentalists, their response would be to put up what I've taken to calling a Gandhi shield. And they would say the words Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Dalai Lama again and again, as fast as they can to keep all evil thoughts at bay. Um, and then grassroots environmentalists would do the same thing, but then they would come up to me after the talk and they would say, thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> and then other groups of people, like prisoners and family farmers, survivors of domestic violence, uh, American Indians, uh, radical environmentalists, I know I'm missing uh, the poor, a lot of people of color, would have an entirely different response, which is they would look at me like, so can you tell us something we don't know? And let's go, bro. And I realized the difference was that for those latter groups, violence is not some theoretical question to be puzzled through. It's simply a part of life. That doesn't mean you participated in it. It doesn't mean you don't participate in it. But it's not some abstract or spiritual question. Not to say that, I'm sorry? It means you know it in your body. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the, the next part of it was that I found that a lot of the responses that I was getting were really stereotypical, not from those latter groups, but from the former group. There was all these cliches that were getting thrown out that the, the more I thought about them, the less, the less that they meant. Like people would say, oh my god, Derek, you know, if you had enough love, you would never suggest fighting back, because, because if you love, you don't fight back. And, um, I don't think that love implies pacifism, and I think that Mother Grizzly Bears will back me up on this one. Um, I grew up in the country, and in my life, I have been attacked by mother horses, cows, dogs, cats, geese, geese, <laughs> chickens, mice, hawks, eagles, Hummingbirds, spiders, who thought I was attacking their babies. And if a mother mouse is going to take on somebody 8,000 times her size, what the hell's wrong with us? 
And then another one is um, you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And I love Audrey Lord. She's great. A, she's not a pacifist, and anybody who ever says this in sort of a pacifistic sense has never read her essay, because it has nothing to do with pacifism. It has to do with we need a wide, wide range of voices is actually what the essay is about. But and as much as I love Audrey Lord, I'll tell you this much, um, she never worked construction. Because it doesn't matter whose goddamn tools you use. Um, <laughs> you use my tools, you use your tools, master's tools, doesn't matter. And there's another problem with that, too, which is it presumes that the house belongs to the master. But it's just a house. And it also presumes that the tools belong to the master. It presumes that violence is one of the master's tools. You know, those in power are trying to tell us that they own the land. They're trying to tell us that they own the water. They're trying to tell us they own genetic materials. I'll be goddamned if I'm going to give them violence, too. And once again, I think Mother Grizzlies are going to back me up on this one. Um, what's another one we always hear? Oh, God, this one's embarrassing. This is so embarrassing. Um, how many people in here have the book A Language Older Than Words? OK, those of you who have that book, do you also have um, like a straight razor or a razor blade? OK, what I would like for you to do is, is the chapter of Violence Revisited, take the razor, cut the pages out, crumple them up, and throw them away. Put them in the, put them in the fire. Because, oh god, this is so embarrassing. It's like, it's like, it's like admitting I'm a compulsive masturbator, which I'm not. Um, <laughs> um, OK, in that book, in that chapter, oh god, this is terrible. I actually say, I say that if you fight back, you run the risk of becoming like they are. Oh my god. It's like, that's so stupid. I mean, does that mean that the woman who kills a rapist runs the risk of becoming a rapist? Does that mean that the tiger who kills a zookeeper runs the risk of becoming a zookeeper? <laughs> I, it's, it's, does it, I mean, does that mean that Tecumseh ran the risk of becoming like the people who are stealing his land? It makes no sense. Um, or what's another one? Um, Oh, this is the best one. And then, and then I'll bash hope for a while. Um, um, violence never accomplishes anything. Um, OK, so if violence never accomplishes anything, what that means is that all the Africans who came over in the Middle Passage, they just jumped on the ships. And then when they're over here, they just worked in the fields for the hell of it. And what this means is that the American Indians, um, they just saw the white people and they said, hey, you want some land? Your way of living is way better than ours, so just take it. You'll treat it better than we do. And there's this great line by, by um, Robin Morgan. She says, anywhere in the world, any woman can be walking alone late at night, and if she hears footsteps behind her, she has reason to be afraid. And she calls that the democracy of fear. Do not fucking tell me that violence doesn't accomplish, any, accomplish anything. It has systematically terrorized half of the population of human beings. And violence is dreadfully, dreadfully effective. That's why they use it. OK. So. A few years ago, I got a call from a friend of mine who works on toxics issues in Northern California. And she, uh, she was crying. And she said, this work's getting to me. It breaks, it's breaking my heart, this environmental work. I can't take it. I said, yeah, this work really can get to you. It'll break, it'll break your heart for sure. It'll do that. And then she said, dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it does, even itself. She said, it has death urge, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it does. She said, unless it stops, it's going to kill everything on the planet, isn't it? I said, yeah, it is, unless it's stopped. And then she said, we're not going to make it to some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? And I said, I've been waiting for you to say that. And the reason I said that to her is because about 12 or 13 years ago now, I was undergoing a similar collapse where I was just bursting into tears several times a week, 
over the death of the salmon, sturgeon, bull trout, Selkirk caribou. And a lot of my environmentalist friends were saying, God, Derek, take some time off. You know, the problems still be there when you come back. <laughs> it's so funny. I can always tell activist audiences because they laugh at that, and non-activist audiences don't, don't get the joke. Um, anyway, um, I knew that I didn't need to just take time off and then come back to the same old thing. I knew that I had to keep pushing because if you're not going to cry about the death of the salmon, what are you going to cry about if tears mean anything? And so I just kept pushing. And then one day I called this American Indian friend of mine, Jeanette Armstrong. She's an Okanagan writer and activist. And I said, you know, this work's killing me. It's breaking my heart. I said, yeah, it'll do that. I said, you know, the, the dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? She said, yeah, it does even itself. I said, it has a death urge, doesn't it? She said, yeah, it does. I said, unless it's stopped, it's going to kill everything on the planet, isn't it? She said, yeah, it is, unless it's stopped. I said, we're not going to make it some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? And then she said the best thing she could possibly say, which is, I've been waiting for you to say that. And the reason that was the best thing she could say is because it normalized my despair. It let me know that despair is an appropriate response to a desperate situation. And it let me know that sorrow is just sorrow and pain is just pain. And it's not so much the sorrow or even pain that hurts as it is my resistance to it. I can hold in my heart the understanding that we're really fucked and that life is really good. Okay. And I mean, there's this, this idea that if you really start to internalize how bad things are, that you have to walk around being miserable all the time. And it's like I got this, this letter from somebody once asking how my anger at the dominant culture affected my sex life. And I was really tempted to respond, that's a question to which you will never know the answer. Um, but I realized that what that question's about is that question presumes that anger is a shotgun and that if I'm angry at the dominant culture and if I'm angry at corporations, I'm angry at my friends. But the truth is I'm angry at the things that make me angry and I'm not angry at the things that don't make me angry. And I'm happy because of the things that make me happy and I'm not happy because of the things that don't make me happy. What a concept. And so anyway, one of the really important things was that I realized that I could feel all those things and it wouldn't kill me. But there's something even more important happened which is that I realized that I could feel all those things and it would kill me. And there's a wonderful thing about being dead, which is that once you're dead, they can't touch you anymore. You can still sing and you can still dance and you can still make love and you can still fight like hell, but they can't touch you. Not with threats, not with promises, not with violence, not with anything. The smartest thing the Nazis did was they made it so that at every step of the way, it was in the Jews' rational best interest to not resist. Would you rather get an ID card, or would you rather resist and possibly get killed? You want to move to a ghetto, or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to get on a cattle car, or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? You want to take a shower, or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? At every step of the way, it was in their rational best interest to not resist. But I'll tell you something very important which is the Jews who participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had a higher rate of survival than those who went along. The Jews who participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had a higher rate of survival than those who went along. The Jews who participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had a higher rate of survival than those who went along. Take the <laughs> Don't stop there. Keep that in mind over the next 10 years. Part of the reason that my mother stayed with my father was because there weren't battered women's shelters in the 50s and 60s. But another part of the reason that she stayed with him was because of the false hope that he would change. And false hopes bind us to unlivable situations, and they blind us to real possibilities. Does anybody really think that warehouses are going to stop deforesting because we ask nicely? 
Does anybody really think that Monsanto is going to stop Monsantoing because we asked nicely? <laughs> Some Democrats brought me to a talk somewhere, and um, God, it was so funny. Um, it was it was close to home, so my mom came along, and um, it was so funny. They asked me, "So, what are you going to talk about tonight?" And I I said they had dinner for me beforehand, and they said, "What are you going to talk about tonight?" I said, "I'm talking about bringing down civilization." It's like dead silence, and then. Later on, during the, during the dinner, um, the, uh, one of the people is saying, God, if we can just take over the, if we can just get a, pre a Democrat in the White House, things are going to be okay. <laughs> and if we can just take over the House and the Senate, things will be okay. I'm thinking, yeah, I wouldn't mind taking over the House and Senate, but that's I mean it differently than you do. Um, <laughs> it's a joke, Mr. Gonzalez. Put away the electrodes. Um, anyway, so, so they're saying all this about, you know, if we could just take over the, the House and the Senate. And my mom said, you know, the uh, Democrats are just as controlled by corporations as Republicans are. And it was so funny, because it was just like my mom had just hiked up a cheek and farted. Um, <laughs> because they, uh, you know, it's, it's silence, and then noses are wrinkling. And then finally somebody says, could you please pass the hummus? It's really delicious. Um, so what are the false hopes that keep us bound to the system? I mean, it's like, it's like Zygmunt Bauman said about, about World War II, in his great book, um, Modernity and the Holocaust, um, he said in there that rational people w will go quietly, meekly into a gas chamber if only allow them to believe it's a bathroom. And I would say that rational people will go quietly, meekly to the end of the world if only you allow them to believe that recycling is going to make a difference. Um, so what are the false hopes that keep us bound to the system? What are the false hopes that keep you chained? But the problem isn't just false hopes, but their hope, it's, it's hope itself. Um, what is hope? I was bashing hope a few years ago, and somebody in the audience shouted out, what, what is hope? And it's like, i got no idea. I've been bashing for years. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And I asked the audience, what's your definition of hope? And the, uh, the definition they came up with is great, which is, hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. Hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. I mean, that's how we use it in everyday language. I mean, I don't hope that... I eat something else tonight because um, I'm kind of hungry. Um, I mean, I know men are supposed to be afraid of commitment, but I'm going to just say this in public, that I am going to eat tonight. I am, I, in fact, I don't even need to commit to it. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> On the other hand, the next time I get on a plane, I hope it doesn't crash because once I'm in the air, I have no agency. The point is that when we say, you know, I hope that coho salmon survive, what we're saying is I have no power. I have no agency. What, 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 what salmon need to survive, it's very, very simple. Salmon need six things to survive. They need for dams to be removed. They need for um, industrial logging to stop, industrial fishing to stop. They need for the oceans not to be murdered. They need for global warming to stop, which means that they need for the industrial economy to stop and the, the oil economy to stop. And they need for um, industrial agriculture to stop because of runoff. Those are all straightforward technical tasks. I didn't say they're not daunting but they're straightforward technical tasks. When people say, gosh, how can we save the salmon? Well, it's real easy. What is impossible is to save the salmon and keep dams, industrial logging, industrial fishing. That is not possible. And so, once again, okay, if I say I hope that salmon survive, what I'm saying is I have no power. I do not hope that coho salmon survive. I will do whatever it takes to make sure the dominant culture doesn't drive them extinct. If they want to go because they don't like how they're being treated and so they want to go away, I will say goodbye and I will miss them. But if they do not want to go away, I will not allow the dominant culture to drive them extinct. I will do whatever it takes. Finally, I want to talk very briefly about a uh, tradition of the Cheyenne dog soldiers. Uh, it's called the picket, pin, and stake. Before a battle, a few of the bravest Cheyenne dog soldiers would be chosen to wear sashes of tanned skins called dog ropes. Attached to each dog rope was a picket pin, normally used to tether horses. During battle, the pin would be driven into the ground as a mark of resolve. Once the pin was driven, the dog soldier would remain staked to that piece of ground, even to his death. Retreat was no longer an option. The pin could only be removed when everyone was again safe or when another dog soldier relieved him of his duty. It is time. I have driven my picket pin. 
I am staked out and willing to give in no more. Where will you drive your own picket stake? Where will you choose to make your stand? Give me a threshold, a specific point at which you'll finally stop running, at which you'll finally fight back. Stand with me. Stand and fight. I am one. We would be two. Two more might join and we would be four. When four more join, we will be eight. And we will be eight people fighting whom others will join. And then more people and more. Stand and fight. The questions before each of us now are, what are your gifts and how can you use them in the service of your land base? What can you do? What does your land base most need from you? How can you achieve it? What do you want to do? And right now, perhaps most important of all, what are you willing to do? People ask me all the time, what do you want us to do with all this analysis? What do you want us to do? And I always say, don't listen to me. If you want to know what to do, go down to the Columbia. I don't know how to live sustainably. The Columbia does. It knows how to live here. It's lived here a very long time. If you want to know what to do, go down, ask the river. It'll tell you. And the real question is, are you willing to do it? Thank you very much.